tonight. Dealing with grief and loss. A biblical perspective. Amen. Possibly before I start, let me see the hands of all and well, all of us here who have experienced the loss of a loved one. Been through that experience. Somebody pretty close to you died. All right, so we want to look at grief and loss. And let me see the hands again. Is the experience an, an easy one? Not a very easy one to deal with. Very, very difficult one to deal with. And so we want to tread carefully at this very sensitive issue tonight. And trust God that we will receive strength and help. When we speak about grief, what exactly is grief? So we're going to start with the question, what is grief? And one of the things I want us to understand from the onset, that grief is a natural response to loss. It is a natural response. Not an unnatural one. In fact, it is unnatural not to grieve. It is natural to grieve at the loss of a loved one. It is the emotional suffering that we feel when something or someone we love is taken away from us. Death is the great separator separates husbands from wives friends from friends church brothers from church brothers church sisters from church sisters death the great divider and brothers and sisters one of the things that we have to come to grips with as we look at this whole business of grief and loss is that death is an ever is an ever present reality there is no one in this room tonight that can say with 100% certainty that they will go to bed tonight and wake up to see another day there is none of us in fact James says that our life is but like a vapor that appears for but a brief moment and then it vanishes away. And he says, listen, don't even sweat too much about tomorrow because tomorrow is not promised unto any man. In fact, he says, if we are to discuss tomorrow, let's say it like this, if the Lord if it's in God's will, then tomorrow I will awake and get ready for work. But what if God chooses not to go down that road with us? The Lord giveth. Blessed be the name of the Lord. So death is an ever-present reality that we have to wrestle with as human beings. And so grief is a natural response to the loss of a loved one. When someone or something that we love there to us is taken away from us, then it's natural that we will experience grief. And to be very honest, the more significant the loss or the closer we are to the person, is the more intense the grief is. But even subtle losses can still lead to great grief. Because sometimes many of us don't know what we have until we lose it. 
Let me put it another way. We do not know the value of each other. My God. We do not know the worth or the value of each other until we are called one day to go to the morgue and we see a lifeless body on a steel table waiting for identification. No movement. Graveyard. Death is an ever-present reality. And because of the fact that death is an ever-present reality, undoubtedly then, from time to time, we are going to experience that emotion of grief. Now, let me see the hands of those of us again who have experienced grief of one kind or another. Okay. I want to make an important note for all of us to understand something about this grieving process. Everybody deals with grief differently. Let's put it another way. Everyone grieves differently. There are some people who will go through their difficult loss smiling. There are some who will throw themselves down on the ground and roll and some people will say are we wrong with him everybody deals with grief some people have a stone cold face one of the most painful funerals I've ever preached in my life was preaching this church Young lady from Portmore by the name of Wyvonia lost her husband. Don't many of us remember that. But at the funeral, in the middle of my sermon, she went on the ground and started to roll. Now I had the option to stop preaching or to continue. And there were persons trying to contain her. I said, leave her alone. If she wants to roll, let her roll. Because everybody deals with grief. And you see, if you don't let her roll now, woo, trouble. So some persons will cry. Some persons will smile at first. There are those who will find solace in the company of friends and family. But all of us Deal with grief differently. Please note again that grieving is a personal and highly individual experience. So I cannot use my experience of how I grieve to judge how you must behave. Let's say that again. Grieving is a personal and highly individual experience everybody deals with it differently and so we have to be careful of our expectations of persons when they go through grief because because I deal with it one way I expect that everybody going to behave like me Everybody don't deal with grief the same way. How you deal with grief depends on many factors. Number one, it depends on your personality. It depends on your coping styles. It depends on your own life experiences. Because there are some persons who have been battered in the morning. And when noon they come, and they think that they have come out of one struggle... At noonday, another struggle confronts them. And by the time the evening breaks. So there are some persons who will buckle sometimes because the pressure just keeps mounting and mounting. Have you ever had that kind of experience? Before you can even uh, process one experience, here comes 
another one. And, and sometimes that becomes an extremely difficult experience. So how we grieve depends sometimes on our faith. The kind of faith that we have. And the nature of the loss that we experience. Now, there are some persons who will tell you that life seems difficult to continue. When they, have, when they lose someone who has been so close to them. And unless you have been close to somebody like that. You can't understand what they are talking about. And sometimes as Christians, we can be very insensitive. When people experience grief and loss. Because sometimes we, we believe that simply because we are Christians. And good, good Christians. That we must be able to navigate and deal with everything. Brothers and sisters, everybody deals with grief differently. And also note that the grieving process takes time. Everybody say time. You can't force somebody out of grief. It takes time. And healing happens gradually you don't just get over it just like that healing happens gradually and it can't be forced or hurried come on brother man get over it get over it in jesus name move on they who die in the gospel shall arise the first blessed are they who die in the lord cheer up man There is no normal timetable for grieving. It's a process and it takes time. And brothers and sisters, let me just share this with you. That a lot of times because of people's expectations of us. Especially those of us who are in ministry. We believe that we have to be superman and superwoman. Because people expect us to be road models and to be strong. Well, let me, let me just clarify for you clearly my position. That with all desire, I desire to be the best role model for everybody at Bethel. But bear in mind that I am human. And as human at best, flawed like everybody else. Grieve just like everybody else. And I do not wish to or intend to profess to be anything else but that. Don't want anybody to have any idealistic views of me personally. It's a personal statement now. Because you see, when people go through grief, because of the expectation that is set on them, we then pull ourselves into this kind of mode that, you know, I'm a minister of the Lord. <laughs> Cannot break down like that. But guess what? Jesus himself was a man of sorrow. And grief was his acquaintance. He went by the tomb of Lazarus. And he wept. Some will argue. That he hollered. Because of the unbelief. Some will argue. That he cried. Because of the loss of his friend. Some would even argue that he cried because of the constant bombardment from the two women. Who said, Master, if you had been here. The reality is, Lazarus was dead. 
He went to the tomb of Lazarus. Knowing that Lazarus was there. He was the king of kings, but yet he subjected himself to human emotions. To experience grief. You know why Jesus had to subject himself to that experience? Because he was going to deliver us from that experience. And everything that we would have experienced in life, Jesus took on himself. That's why the song that we used to sing means so much. Yes, my Jesus traveled on this road before. Tasted every sorrow. Every pain my Jesus bore. So no matter how you suffer, just remember that you don't have to try to be a superman or a superwoman. Just remember Jesus suffered more for Jesus has traveled on this road before so let's look at some myths about grief and then let's look at what is the fact the first myth that I want to talk about tonight is that a lot of times people say the pain will go away faster if we ignore it. If we don't deal with it, just ignore it. Just keep living your life. Don't pre just pretend as if nothing is going on. Just get yourself busy and keep active. And the pain will go away. Guess what? Trying to ignore your pain or keep it from surfacing will only make it It is better to confront it, deal with it, grieve, and move on, than to ignore it. Because there is something that is called delayed grief. And brother, sister, it is worse. It is one of the worst experiences. Because what you intend to ignore or run away have a way of catching up on you. Second myth. It's important to be, to be, <laughs> one of those bees should be out. It is important to be strong in the face of loss. In other words, be a superman. Guess what? The fact is, feeling sad, frightened, or lonely is a normal, everybody say normal, to loss. Even crying is normal. And tell you what, crying don't make you a weakling. You believe that? Strong people can cry? Oh yes. Being strong and crying don't make you a weakling. But look at this other one. Some people believe that if you don't cry it means that you're insensitive and you're not sorry about the loss. Now remember what we said. Everybody grieve. There are some persons who a tear will not come out of their eyes. But their heart is broken. Everybody grieve differently. Crying is a normal response to sadness. But it is not the only one. It is just one. Off. So those who don't cry may feel the pain just as deeply as those who holler. So it doesn't always mean that because you're not crying or the person not crying that the person isn't broken. That's not true. People express emotions differently. A psychiatrist by the name of Kluber Ross did some studies on cancer patients who terminally heal cancer patients. Those who were written off by doctors and had the stark reality that they were facing death. Usually they were given a timeline. Given a time period in which their life would expire. So some of them were told that they would have less than three months, less than six months to live. 
And one of the things she did was to study their whole reaction or their whole response to the concept of death. And not only their response, but the response of those around them. And in her studies, she came up with five stages of grieving that she thinks we go through. And I want to look at those five stages because I believe that there is some merit to all of this. She says that at the first announcement of death, you're at work and somebody calls you and says to you that somebody has passed. What's your first reaction sometimes? Shock. Frightened. And you say, no, you're playing a joke on me. You're serious? You can't be serious. <laughs> it's an interesting thing, you know. She says that the first stage of grieving is denial. Shock. And we say, God, I don't believe this. This is not happening. No, no, no. It's not her. Somebody else. And there are some persons who live in denial and in fact they will not even accept it until they actually see the body. That as far as they are concerned, the person is not. And so one of the issues that we have to confront in the grieving process is the whole business of denial. So God, no, no. That's not, not her. No, no, she's not there. And there are some persons who even in front of the cold body hang on hit the person come on wake up wake up wake up she's not dead she's sleeping denial i i, I vividly remember when my mother died I, I was probably one of the last ones to get get to the hospital and just as I drove into the hospital, I have five sisters and all of them are drama queens. And as, just as we drove into the complex, I saw an ambulance or whatever you call it moving up. And I saw two of my sisters running behind it. Bring back my mother. I said, um, park me right here, son. Don't, don't, don't carry me run with him there. Because as far as they are concerned, she's not dead. And they are running down to pull her out. And I'm like standing there and saying, okay then. I got to be the strong one here. But people tend to go through the initial stages of denial until reality tends to set in. Then when the reality set in, Mrs. Ross says that the next stage that we go through is anger. And by anger, we start to know, God, why is this happening? Why does she have to die? Why does he have to die? Why is this happening to me? And sometimes the anger is even geared towards who? Even God. Why are you allowing this to happen to me? Why no? Can't take any more. Why me? Why does she have to go? And we go through these stages. Anybody who have ever grieved, is it sounding familiar to us? Very much familiar. We go through these stages of, of, of denial and anger. We start to blame ourselves. And in blaming ourselves, sometimes we go through the blame game. Maybe if I was here. Maybe if I had been to come to the hospital earlier. Maybe if I didn't go to work this day. And we start to go through this, this episode of blaming ourselves and blaming others and even blaming and a lot of folks are still struggling. Loved one has died a long time ago, but still in the anger stage. 
still blaming ourselves. Then she says we move from the anger to what she refers to as bargaining. Where we start to know, say God, listen. If you perform a miracle like you did for Lazarus and bring him back or bring her back, I promise you, I will serve you with all my life. I will stand on the street corner and I will witness to everyone I meet. And we start to make bargains with God. Start to now bargain our way through. No God. And some persons even make this bargain. God, take me. Send them back. Sound familiar? Start to bargain our way through. This doesn't happen. It's not real. But then when we realize that death is a reality and oftentimes a final reality for most persons, then comes the fourth stage of depression. And Sir Kishana dealt aptly last week, Sunday night, with the issue of depression. And a lot of times... We become depressed during the loss of a loved one because we feel a sense of helplessness, especially those of us who love to be in control. We are now confronted with a reality that this is something that we just cannot control. This one is outside of our, it is appointed unto man, and after death comes the judgment. So we go into this kind of depression because we feel a sense of helplessness. And all are praying and asking God to spare them, yet they go. We say, God, I don't understand. Then finally, out of that depression comes, she says, acceptance. This is when we bring ourselves to be at peace with what has happened. That is when now we have wrestled with God. And I've come to the place that we realize, for we know what here befalls us. As the songman says, Jesus doeth all things well. This is when we come to realize that the Lord giveth and the Lord has taken and there is nothing I can do about it more than to trust his heart. And to trust him that he knows what's best for me. And he will not put more on us than we can. And if he takes us to it, he will take us through it. And if he confronts us with it, he will give us, he will give us the grace to endure it. Let the church say amen. amen. Oftentimes, because we don't allow ourselves to go through the grieving process. A lot of times, many of us are stuck in one of these five stages. And if we are not careful, we could still find ourselves in that anger stage. Angry with ourselves, blaming ourselves, angry with God, angry with our family members, angry with others. And as a, result, as a result of that, we have not fully grieved and we are not fully delivered. Delivered. Brethren, it is a painful experience to not afford ourselves the opportunity to grieve. Um, years ago, I felt I dealt with my parents' death very well. In fact, the Lord himself told me, not very often I say that, that he would give me special grace. Everybody say special grace. To deal with it. And so, while, I mean, a lot of persons around us were falling apart 
I had this inner strength and peace that was beyond comprehension. But one of the things I did not recognize until years later was that one of the things I did not allow myself to do was to grieve. And let me tell you how it caught up with me. About seven years after, I was moderating a service up here. And I went to sit, and the choir started to sing. And for whatever reason, whatever the, I can't even remember what this song was about. But whatever the reason was, is as if a blanket of grief came and sat on me. And every emotion that I had repressed, denied, suppress hit me in one step i sat there and i cried and i cried even when it was time to go back up i couldn't go back up i suspect there were some folks who were wondering what was wrong with me and what sin i had committed and you know you know you know you know there were persons who was wondering what was happening same one you commit Um, but you know what? It was the most gut-wrenching feeling I've ever had. It was the most painful experience. And it was only in that instance that for the first time, because I didn't cry. I didn't cry. All throughout, I didn't cry. But for the first time, I realized that I've never, ever grieved so I've come to the conclusion that delayed grief it would have been better I had joined my sisters run and faint off for they had this thing where just faint one faint and then once you revive one the next one faint drama queens man But it was the most painful experience. And what I've come to discover that what you try to run away from have a way of catching up on you. And you see when it catch you, I am so glad it caught me in church. I am so glad it happened to me in church. Powerful. Grief. What are some of the common symptoms of grief? Shock and disbelief. We spoke about that already, right? Great sadness. Guilt. And this guilt is sometimes caused because some of us felt as if we have never, we didn't do enough. Could have done some more. And we beat up on ourselves. What if I didn't go home? What if I had stayed? Maybe I could have resuscitated her. And the questions and the guilt. And we carry. And one of the things, as was said on Thursday night, that the enemy is an expert at pumping guilt upon us. An expert. And a whole lot of folks are struggling tonight. And a part of the struggle we are struggling with is our own guilt. But we were told on Thursday night in no uncertain term that Jesus Christ has come to remove. He has died the death to put guilt to death that we can be free. There is also anger. We spoke about that and fear. And then of course there are physical symptoms. For many of us, we can't sleep. For many of us, appetite gone through the window. Gone south. We don't want to eat. Can't sleep. The blood pressure starts to go up. And the symptoms continue. Is what I'm saying resonating with anybody tonight? Are you following? All right, we're going through. 
But what is God's viewpoint about this whole thing about grief and loss? What does God have to say? Is it alright to grieve? I felt that I had to be strong and a superman. But then Ecclesiastes 3, 1 and 4 says, To everything there is a and a time for every under the heaven. There, there is a time to weep. To flush our system. To let it out. To deal with it. And if we don't deal with it, it will eventually... It was like a, a, a door was opened. And everything that was pushed out of my subconscious flooded in at the same time. And one had to deal with all of that. It was, as if, it was as, if, as if it was the first I was told that they had actually died. To everything there is a season and a time for every. A time to weep and a time to. A time to mourn. And a time to dance. There is a, a place for grieving. That, that, that's really what I want to underscore tonight, you know. That there is a place in the body of Christ for grieving. And we ought to allow people to grieve. God's viewpoint. Jesus is our best road model for combat. And what he did, he combined faith and grief. As revealed in St. John 11, 1 to 45. When he turned up at the tomb of his good friend, Lazarus. Bethel, my brothers, my sisters, deep faith in Christ, a strong anointing. Let me say it for you, story. A powerful prayer life does not prevent grief when a believer dies or when we lose a loved one. This that we walk around in is still flesh and. So when Bethel loses a member, the fact that we are filled with the Holy Ghost doesn't take away the need for grieving. It only infuses our grief with hope. So Paul says, we grieve, but we grieve not as those who have. For we know that death for the child of God is but a passage or a gateway into eternal Life. So Paul puts it like this. Absent from the body. Present with Christ. To live is Christ and to die is gain. So when a believer dies, it doesn't mean that we don't grieve. We grieve, but our grief is a little different from those who have no hope. Because we have an assurance, you know. That even if our loved one dies, we will see them again. Oh, praise the Lord. we we'll see them again. So let's look at how we deal with it. Let's deal with it. Number one, strategies for dealing with grief. Number one, grieve. That's the first thing that I will say to you. Grieve. Face your feelings. Though grief is bitter, we must let sorrow have its natural course. Even the Lord Jesus Christ, the prophet Isaiah, in Isaiah 53, verse 3, describes him as a man of and one who experienced grief. A man of sorrow and acquainted with much grief. Surely he has borne our sorrows and carried. We must face our grief. And brothers and sisters, we must allow each other to grieve. And as we grieve, we must support each other. 
unresolved grief, that's what I was talking about, can lead to great complications such as what? Depression, anxiety, substance abuse, and health problems. When we buckle it up. Grief. Number two. Not only must we grieve, but we must believe. We must put our faith and our confidence in the word of God. Knowing that whatever God takes us through, there must be a purpose for it. Brethren, do you understand that the God that we serve loves us with an everlasting love? That he's not an unkind and wicked God that wants to put us through unnecessary pain and turmoil. And that whatever happens to us, that he's concerned and he cares. And he's there for us. So we must put our trust and our confidence and believe that if I have to walk through this, I am not going to walk through this. The psalmist says, though I walk through, I will fear no, for thou art. We must believe that when we face, when we are faced with the issue of grief and loss, we are not alone. That God is with us. And brethren, you have to be careful. That sometimes when you go through your grief and loss, you have to be careful of who minister to you. Because there are some miserable comforters who will come to you in your time of grief and loss and will give you the wrong advice. Job had three such friends. Can you imagine? Lost your cattle. Lost your house, lost your health, lost your children, even your very wife. And your friends came and for days they sat before you and said nothing at all. And when they do open their mouth, they say the wrong You have to be careful because even when you go through some difficult experiences, there are those who will come to tell you that it's God punishing you for the sins you have committed. That's what he did to his only begotten son. It pleased God to bruise him and to make his soul an offering for sin. And so Job's friends came and said, mm -mm. Job, this is not normal, you know. You do something. Tell me what you do. But you know, the Bible, the Bible is so unique. Because in all of this, Job kept his integrity. In all of this, Job kept his integrity. So you have to be careful that when you are believing God, and then there are some folks who will come to tell you that God has forgotten you. Or God has forsaken you. You don't see. You don't see. Everything happening to you. God has forgotten you. And if you are not careful. Because of the anger that we experience in grief. We become so angry with God. That we backslide. You know. And we have to be so careful, brothers and sisters, that when we go through our grief, that we listen for the voice of he who has called us out of darkness, saying, Lo, I am with you always, even until. So we must know. And we don't always know why. Because some of, one of the questions we ask a lot is why? Why him? Why her? Why no? Why this? 
But the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 55, 9 says, For as the heavens are higher, so are God's ways higher, and God's thoughts higher than our thoughts. But we have to believe that God loves me, and God knows what's best for me, and if God brings me to it, he will take me through it. And I am not a no. I am not forgotten. God knows. So we must grieve, believe, and thirdly, number three, we must receive God's desire to give us comfort. You know what the Bible, you know, you know what, what God is described as the God of all comfort. Everybody say all comfort. Brethren, there are some situations that we go through that only God can comfort us. And grief is one of those things. Because nobody knows the pain that we feel like God. It takes God and God alone to understand that kind of deep-seated pain and anguish that we feel. And God is described as a God of all comfort. The Holy Spirit... The paraclete, one who comes alongside and assists us in the journey. That God is present even in our darkest day. Let me put it another way. Even in our darkest night, God is still present. That's why the psalmist was said with confidence, you know. Even if I'm walking through the valley, thou art with me. I will fear no evil. God desired to give us comfort, but we must reach out and accept it. Through prayer and meditation on his words, we can find a place where he will wrap his arms around us as a loving father would and console us. Because there are some pain that no human can deal with. There are some pain that only God can soothe. Only the God of all comfort can comfort us. So we must grieve. Go through the process. Believe. And receive God's grace. To endure. Then grieving is not something that we can do all by ourselves. Number four. We must turn to friends and family members. Guess what? If people ever need a shoulder to lean on. It's when they have lost a loved one. Lean on people who care about you and accept the assistance that they have to offer. You don't have to tough it out alone. You know, some people believe that they have to tough it out alone. You don't have to tough it up alone. Why do you think God brought you into this big family? That we can share in each other's what? Grief. And there's a, there's a benefit to be gained, you know. Because, listen, since death is common to all men, the help I offer you today is in my best interest too. Because I don't know what will happen tomorrow. And perchance the person you help today will be the one who will help you tomorrow. Come on, somebody. So, one of the best things to do is to rely on the support of friends and family. And when we talk about family, we are not talking about just your biological family members. But we are talking about the family of God. That we ought to be there for each other. And sometimes being there, being there just means holding the person's hand. Some people will say, Brother Michael, sometimes I don't know what to say. The best thing is to say absolutely nothing. Just be there. Just be present. If you don't know what to say, just be present. Sometimes people understand exactly that you care. So sometimes you see them just nod. They understand. Because one of the worst things you want to do is to say something and say the can do more damage that way than good. Lean on people 
who care about us, man, and accept the assistance. They are, God has placed people in our lives to be there for us. We don't need to be angry with ourselves and angry with God and angry at each other. We can deal with it. We can lean on each other. Lean on me when you are not strong. I'll be your friend. Help you carry on. For it won't be long that I'm going to need somebody to lean on. Then, I have found that it's, it helps the grieving process when we can express our feelings in a tangible or creative way. For some persons, they make a scrapbook or photo album of some sort of our loved one celebrating the person's life. And especially if the person lived for a cause and a purpose, then we can make a contribution towards that cause or that purpose to perpetuate the memory of the person. And think about the pleasant memories of the times that were spent together. Some people do a journal. You know what I mean by a journal? Write your thoughts daily and keep it. For some persons, they do a scrapbook or a photo album celebrating the person's life. Mm. Find creative ways to remember the person. Number six. Sometimes, grief is so painful. And grief can feel so lonely. That even when you have loved ones around you, you still feel lonely. Sometimes it's important for you to join a support group. And a support group is a group of persons who have been through a similar or the same experience that you have been through. Because I tell you this much, unless you have walked in another person's shoe, you really, really, truly can't really understand all that they are, they are talking about, you know. And you really can't truly help the situation unless you can feel. That's why Christ had to, that's why God had to take on human attire you know, to feel everything that we would have felt so that he could deal with us. So that the Bible says he was at all points tempted or tested like we were yet without sin. That's why he can be touched with the feelings of our. And unless you walk down the road, you will see people in grief and criticize them needlessly. And the reason why you do that partly is because of ignorance, because you, have, you don't have the knowledge or the experience. But when you walk the road, Sometimes you don't have to even say anything. The Holy Spirit in you identify with the experience in the person. Because you have been down that road before. So sometimes it may be necessary. And I know in a lot of churches not, that there are support groups that meet on a regular basis to assist persons to, to process grief. Because remember I said it doesn't go away Immediately, it takes what? Time. So there are support groups and sometimes it may be necessary to talk to a counselor. Because some persons get stuck somewhere in the grieving process and cannot function effectively. And so sometimes, and I know from many of us, especially us men, who love to have this macho image. To go to a counselor seem like you're asking us to commit a sin. Because big man don't. And big man don't go to counselors. But deal with our issue our way. But it doesn't work like that. Sometimes we need to talk to somebody. Because if we don't talk to somebody. That is why, you know, you realize that is why it's much easier for me. It, 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 men tend to commit suicide more than women. 
Because a lot of times, they are a lot of bottled up. And we feel as if we can't talk to anybody. But there's always somebody that you can. And let me deal with this. I hear it all the while. And I tell you the devil is a liar. Because one of the things the devil tells people is that there's nobody in church you can talk to. And there's nobody in church you can trust. Brethren, I will be the first to tell you that is not everybody in church you can trust. For Jesus said the wheat and tear must grow together until. But I refuse to believe that in Bethel 20 South Camp Road that all of us can't be trusted. God would not play such a cruel trick on you. God would not play such a cruel trick on you. There must be at least one person that each of us can talk to. And brethren, anytime the enemy comes to tell you that there's nobody at church you can talk to, that is something you ought to rebuke out of your spirit. Because what he wants to do is to lock you down in bondage. And to keep you shut down in a little corner. And to keep you in your own psychological space. Defeated, angry, bitter, miserable with everybody else. And he knows that the minute you break that cycle, that deliverance is on the other side. And he shuts us down. And gets us to distrust each other to the point that we can't even talk to each other. Everybody in church must have somebody you can talk to. Man. And I don't mean just say praise the Lord. You can put down your hair and talk, talk and have know that what you say. You don't believe me? When you can, everybody, Bishop Thompson, you have to have somebody that you can put off the bishop and just be ira and talk. Everybody must have somebody like that. Or else the enemy will whip us in the morning, whip us in the evening, whip us. But a threefold cord is not easily broken. So when he thinks that, okay, it's just Michael are coming after, he has another guest coming. Because I have backup on my left and somebody's backing me up on my. That's why God has brought us into a divine fellowship. Everybody say fellowship. Fellowship. Talk to somebody. Don't back it up. Talk. And if you, if you can't find anybody in here to talk to, talk to some of us. We know some good people elsewhere if you want to talk. But don't back it up. Let me see the hands of those who can talk to somebody. Yeah. Let me see that. You know this, I'm not looking. Number seven. I have several persons I can talk to. Plan ahead for grief triggers. Triggers. Let me explain what grief triggers are. Anniversaries. Just around the time when the person dies. You have to be careful that you plan in advance for those times. For instance, I know that when it comes to Christmas time and New Year's, that's a time. Yeah. I need a lot of support. Because that's around the time, you know? And you have to plan ahead to know. Because dates, time, place have a way of triggering back those memories. Are you, you follow what I'm saying, brethren? So we have to it have a way of reawakening those memories and feelings in us. So we have to be prepared for an emotional wallop. To know that around that time, we're going to be sucked back into that little mode. And we have to be prepared. Because if we are not prepared, grief will overtake us again. So we have to know what's happening, plan for it, and prepare for it. In your booklets, can you please just join me in turning, in closing... 
to page 68 of the booklet. And the subtopic, Helping Others Through Grief. I'm closing. Two more minutes and I'm out of here. The Bible says, Blessed be the God of all comfort who comforts us in all our tribulations that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by. So we have been wounded simply to help the wounded. So the experiences we go through Sometimes it's not necessarily for us. Sometimes it is to prepare us to help those who are coming after us. So Paul says, blessed be the God of all comfort who has comforted us through tribulation that we may be able to comfort those. Do you know why God take you through all that you go through? To prepare you for ministry. Because somebody else may come down the road. And they're going to go through something and believe that they can't make it. But because you went through it before and God was there for you. When you see them struggling, you can stand by them and say, Sister, I know exactly what you've been there. But God was with me and God is here for you. So Paul says, with the comfort that we have received from God, we can comfort one another. So brethren, whatever you go through, stop cursing God. Say thank you Jesus because you must have put me through this. Because somewhere somebody going to walk this road before, down, down this road. And when they come, I'll be there to say press on. Though the way seems here. Press on, God is ever near. Press on and in Christ be strong. The fight will not be. long a silver lining in sorrow's dark cloud is that God can use our experiences to reach out to others with compassion and comfort brethren I did not understand why people have to ball and holler and carry on like them crazy when people die until and there are some things you will never understand until it happens to us so everyone grieves differently depending on our personality, religious beliefs, maturity in helping others who grieve. Brother Michael, I know somebody who's grieving. How, how, how can I help them? Number one, ask God for guidance about when to speak and what to. Use this booklet as a guide. All the things that we have discussed about grieving and understanding the grieving process. Understand what people are going through. And I'll give you a general rule. If you don't know what to say, just be there. Sometimes just hug them. Squeeze their hand. Just hold their hands. Don't have to say much. Encourage the bereaved person to share his or her feeling. So you may say to the person, do you wish to talk about it? If they want to talk about it, you don't be a talker. You be a? Just listen. And when we listen, don't be judged. Because a lot of times, and the reason for that, a lot of times, remember one of the stages that they are going to go through is anger. And a lot of times when they start to talk, that anger is going to come out. You're going to hear it. You're going to see it coming out. You have to sometimes don't be very judgmental. We put those who. Then we must avoid platitudes. Let the person feel sorrow without implying that he or she should cheer up or be joyful in the Lord. I keep saying that when people grieve, they do not need a sermon. They need a shoulder. Because sometimes we are very good at the preaching. Cheer up, my child. Come on. You will see them again on the first resurrection. Where you balling for the person was saved. Wait your turn. You will know why me balling. Ignore.
ignore these and avoid these platitudes because brethren we think it sounds cute but sometimes it can be very painful and it comes across as being very insensitive very insensitive very insensitive one of the most gut-wrenching feel um story i heard was told by the Reverend Dr. Yvette Noble Bloomfield. Most of you would remember years ago as a family counselor on radio. She now resides in Cayman. And she was sharing with me, because of her training and her experience, she was passionate at the time, and because of her training and her experience as a family counselor for years and stuff, when her parents died, she said she had to pull herself from the jaws of bitterness. And you know who she had to pull herself from the jaws of bitterness? Against? Not family. But other ministers. Other reverends. Because everybody assumed that because she's a pastor and because she's a trained counselor, that she must be and all she got was all the little platitudes. The little platitudes, you know. You, you, you're well used to this. You can handle this. You have been down. You can handle this. Now, listen to this. The fact that I help you to go through it is no guarantee that I can make it through it without help. Understand that. So she said, listen, Michael, it was the most painful experience because she got little. The kind of encouragement because others felt that it was okay. But not because you're a pastor, not because you are a counselor means that you are not allowed to. And grieving cannot be rushed. Finally. Don't push or preach. But if the person indicates an openness, pray, share a meaningful scripture, but try to avoid the temptation of preaching. Just be there. Be a shoulder to lean on. That's a message in itself. Do you know that there's a message in your presence? That's a strong message in itself. Let's be there. May the Lord help us to grieve. May the Lord help us to grieve and accept our grief, to believe in his promises and to receive the comfort that only he can give. God bless you tonight. In Jesus name. Praise the Lord everyone. Praise the Lord. Just want to give God thanks for Overseer Lewis and for the wonderful teaching that he has brought forth tonight. And I trust that those of us who are here who have encountered loss and grief have been encouraged. There are persons who are still struggling. There are persons who are still feeling the pain of loss. But um, we have been comforted tonight. Praise the Lord. Praise God. Is there anyone here in need of prayer? The altar is open. And we're going to sing from the Pentecostal hymnal, number 103. It says, never alone. You know, we can have loss, loss of family. It could be loss of job. could be loss of friends. It could be any kind of loss, loss of health. And people grieve over these things. But tonight we have a better understanding. And 
we trust that the Lord will help us that whether we are grieving, we will understand the process, or if somebody else is grieving, that we'll be better able to assist them. Praise the Lord. Let us stand at this time.